Oh, hi. Hello there, this is Let's Talk About Myths, baby! And I am that woman who will take literally any excuse to talk about characters like Medea and Cersei. But let's be honest, mostly Medea. I am Liv. <laughs> I don't even know what that was. Today, though, we are in for something a little bit different. First, this is a conversation episode, obviously. I spoke with the absolutely lovely Antonia Aluko, who's doing her PhD in witches. But not just witches. Witches and intersectionality in Roman imperial literature. Fancy! But most importantly, it's witches. That's why we're here. And in today's conversation, it's two specific versions of two specific witches, Medea and Circe, as they appear in Ovid's Metamorphoses. And man, Roman witches are fucking wild. The departure from the traditional Greek versions is fascinating. And so when he tries to play around with these Greek witches, but in Roman lit, something magical kind of happens. And Tony and I had so much fun chatting about this. It's absolutely mind-blowing looking at the ways that Ovid changed these well-known characters and the way he turned them into versions that more closely align with the Roman idea of witches, but not completely. And the Romans, they did not like witches. They were not kind to witches. Remember that conversation I had last spooky season with Maxwell Paul? Yeah, like those witches. Weird and gross and, and old. Always old. That's the Roman witchcraft for you. So sit back and enjoy, because what would spooky season even be without a chat about mythological witches? And in this case, a deeply, ridiculously nerdy, so nerdy, chat. Because on a number of occasions, the two of us have a lot of fun and, and deeply, nichely dorky realizations. Uh... It was exciting, to say the absolute least. Also, on Tuesday, I plan on giving you all the full rundown on these versions of Medea and Circe in, in more detail, because frankly, I didn't really realize how different and unique they were until I chatted with Antonia, and now I'm obsessed with looking at what exactly makes them so much of a departure from the traditional Greek versions. For now, though, ugh, listen to this very fun and interesting and straight-up witchy conversation. Conversations, which witch is the best witch? Ovid's Medea and Circe with Antonia Luco. Witchcraft, but then it was like intersectionality as well, right? Like, tell me what you yeah. study. It's so exciting. So... Um, just a little general intro about me. Yeah. Um, I'm doing a first year PhD student and I'm doing my PhD at UCL, um, University College London. And my project's on witches and intersectionality, but specifically like the intersectionality of uh, magic use and gender and ethnicity in Imperial Latin text. It's a bit Ooh. of a mouthful. <laughs> yeah, but interesting. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so what I'm kind of really focused on is kind of viewing witches as intersectional beings in the ancient world, um, especially because of their characterizations, which um, kind of set them off as like a ethnicity within itself. So witchcraft mm. is kind of like its own, it has its own history, its own culture, its own associations and myth. So then witches then in this, in the intersectional context are not only just women who use magic but also women their own very specific kind of cultural heritage and so if we look at witches using intersectional theory kind of like as their magic use being an extra layer onto their discrimination in the ancient world then we get a very very specific picture of this kind of overly extreme 
very chaotic, very monstrous figure whose, you know, sexuality, age, gender, um, and ethnicity all play a part in how she's perceived in the ancient world. So that's kind of like a very general basis of my project. Um, so I'm looking at a variety of different primary texts. Right now, I'm very focused on Ovid, so I'm going to be talking mm. about him a lot. Um, I, I'm not going to complain about that. <laughs> <laughs> Our favorite problematic king. Um, yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm really focused on Ovid at the moment, but I have been looking at Seneca earlier on this year. Um, my project, fingers crossed, should um, be talking about um, Apuleius as well, and Lucan, and Horace. So yeah, like all, all over the imperial pe um, period, but like what connects them is witches, mm -hmm. um, yeah. which, you know, hopefully it should be very, very fun. I'm enjoying it so far. So that's really good. <laughs> I mean, witches are super cool. So it just sounds like a great project. So one thing that, that immediately comes up for me as soon as I hear that you're talking about Rome um, is like one, obviously, as you know, I'm not particularly familiar with Rome. Always thrilled to have people on to teach me about Rome, but it just means I don't have like as much of a background myself. But one thing that came up when I last spoke to somebody who talks about Roman witches um, is the thing that stands out for me the most is the difference between Greek and Roman witches. So obviously I just want to hear you talk generally, but I definitely like, that's a thing that's always fascinated me. So I'm curious, kind of, I'm like already bringing it to Greece. That was not my intention. We will talk about <laughs> Rome. But it, it, you know what I mean though? Like the witches in Greek mythology are like Circe and Medea and they're like really powerful and badass. And there's definitely like all the, you know, there's, other aspects to them but they're not like demonized in a way that they seem to be in Rome so I'm I'm so fascinated to hear everything you have to say basically around that yeah <laughs> that actually takes up a huge part of what I'm talking about in like the bit I'm writing because the the witches in Ovid are um actually well at least I'm talking on the basis of the metamorphoses which is the mm -hmm. main text I'm focusing on in terms and of a good one um, it's it's a very good one, <laughs> um, but in the Metamorphoses, the two main witches are Circe and Medea. So mm. we've got these two women who've got a huge legacy behind them in multiple different ancient texts, and Ovid takes them and he makes them his own in very specific ways. He kind of um, takes these you know these figures who have like such a huge history and legacy from Euripides and from Homer. And, you know, I think Apollonius as well. So, like, many different texts mm -hmm. here. Like, we've got loads of different, like, reference points for him to use. And he takes them and he makes them into these figures of mon complete monstrosity. Um, like, we can't even recognise them almost from their Greek heritage because he makes them the absolute extreme. Mm. And it's really interesting how he does that because then if you look at his other texts, for example, the, uh, the Amores, um, so his love poems, um, mm -hmm. and you see the witches in that, then it's like, there's such similarity. So when we move on from like the, the Greek imagination into the Roman one, and we see these, these witches, it's a very much a distinct version, um, of, of the witch and of magic use that we see, which is highly demonized. And I truly believe that it has something, especially at least for the period I'm working on, which is imperial, um, Latin literature so um we're talking like Augustus onwards I think it really starts off with the Augustan marriage laws because if we see that we're, we're seeing laws being put in place that regulate and that kind of put jurisdiction on what a woman's body should be allowed to do you know should they be allowed to reproduce who with and when and then you get these witches in these in the literature who completely disregard that who say you know what to hell with this i'm gonna do what i want and they're gonna use their magic to do exactly what they want how they want and one particular witch like i was saying the amores who comes to mind is dipsas um who essentially is this aged woman who you know advises of its lover corinna um to kind of like go for a rich man and the way he describes her in that text is 
absolutely insane. And you have to put into context, this is one of the first encounters I've had with like Roman witches. Because when we see witches, especially in the um, British education system, we just think of, you know, Salem witch trials. Mm. We don't actually like think of like, oh, there was witches before the 1600s? What? So this is my first encounter with Roman witches. And I actually like have some of it here. This is like the translation from Poetry in Translation and it's by A.S. Klein. So it's really super accessible, which is why I like them. And it's also the one that I first read. So he says that there's like this certain old woman called Dipsass. And he, he essentially says that she's never sober. Um, she's, <laughs> Perfect <laughs> way to start. Says, yeah, he's like, <laughs> she's never seen, he says, she never seen, she's never seen Dawn with Rosie Horses, a mother of Dark Memnon. So she's, she's never seen a sunrise whilst <laughs> yeah. being sober. <laughs> Um, and then she's like, she's she's learned uh, the Magi's tricks and Cersei's Aeon charms. So instantly she's being harkened back to Cersei. So like the reader like instantly knows, you know what? I'm talking, we're talking about Cersei here. I know exactly the kind of witch. Um, and then he says, she knows what herbs to use, how to whirl the bullroarer and the value of slime from mare on heat. When she wants, she can make cloud gather in the sky. When she wants, she brightens the day with a full sun. And if you believe it, <laughs> I've seen stars drip blood, blood red the very face of the moon. I suspect she changes at will in the shadows of night and her old woman's body grows feathers. <laughs> so instantly, <laughs> you've got this woman who's literally the most horrifying thing known to man. <laughs> being described to us and not only that she can use magic she knows how to use herbs she can draw down the moon and change the way the moon is seen and if you think about how witches are perceived in the greek imagination it's completely different mm -hmm. it's um you know we go from like you know the delicate witches who help you along your journey and make sure everything's gonna be fine and then obviously at the end of medea um of euripides version we get you know, um, a, a, a quite monstrous view of, of her, but nothing to the extent of this. This is a whole new level. Um, and you can instantly see how her age comes into play. It's not mm -hmm. just the fact that she uses magic. It's the fact that she's an old woman. She, you know, can't really, you know, she can't really live her life without <laughs> saying all of this stuff first of all. <laughs> <laughs> it's like oh you know what i'm just gonna advise someone who i really like and it's like nope of it's not happy with you and then you get this like perception of her that's oddly quite horrifying yeah i that's the one thing i remember too it, it just as soon as you're saying that is like the roman witches tend to be more of that kind of idea of like an old crone that really yes. like old and decrepit and like gross like he's they're they're described as like pretty gross whereas yeah in, in greek like for all medea's crimes like she is young and presumably beautiful based on kind of everything that happens around her and the thing about euripides too is like it is bad obviously what she does but like he really gives you reasons to understand her in a way that is al obviously my favorite thing like i i talk about it near constantly but but, like, you get it. You're like, yeah, you know, she did these horrific things, but, like, I wouldn't do it myself, but I can see how she got there. Whereas this witch is like, nah, she's just fucking with shit. Like, she's just causing trouble. And that's where, like, Medea, Ovid's Medea really interests me because I, 100% like you, I absolutely love Medea, um, especially the Euripides version, because I, I read it and I was like, oh my gosh, like, I can understand exactly why she did that. Like, it yes. was so justified, you know, we hate Jason, you know, screw him. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but then we get to Ovid's Medea and she is um, the most unsympathetic character. Um, and I truly believe that it's because he wants to, he wants us not to like her. He doesn't want us to sympathize with Medea in the same way that Euripides does. Um, yeah. And it's really clear because in the beginning of um, of Ovid's telling of Medea and the Metamorphoses of Book Seven, he spends like, a good hundred lines giving her a soliloquy, um, and in that she's essentially saying that she shouldn't love Jason, she shouldn't allow it, 
you know, this shouldn't be happen. You know, she shouldn't help him with the golden fleece. Um, she should just leave him alone because this is not good. And like, she's going to lose her homeland. And it's like, oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. I understand, you know, she's saying that she shouldn't go for him. And that makes her sort of redeemable because she then resembles, you know, the girl in his love poetries mm. who kind of, you know, is just, you know, umming and ahhing about whether or not she should go for her love. And she's relatable. And then all of a sudden she starts to help Jason. And then she becomes this horrifying character. And it starts as soon as the soliloquy ends. Cupid turns his back on her. He's literally like, you know what? Ooh. I'm washing my hands. I have nothing to do with this girl. You know, it's it, I I have nothing to do with her. Like, so she she's basically rejected by Cupid. Um, he t literally you think the word he uses is like turgo. He literally turns his back on mm. her. And then the line after that, she's like, well, I'm going to go to Hecate now. <laughs> since, <laughs> since Cupid won't help. It's like the kind of sense of like, since Cupid won't help me, I'm sure Hecate will. Yeah. Um, and as soon as she does that, you see like how she's, she's picking her magic use through Hecate over her love. Um, so something that's more relatable to the reader of just, you know, falling in love and not show like um, this kind of forbidden love, not sure if I should go for it or not then turns into oh i'm just going to use my magic to make everything happen if the gods won't help me i'll use my magic and you know that works for a little bit in Hobbit, until you get to the point where she's trying to um save his father so i'm never sure how to say his name is like eason oh, oh gosh name. don't even i the amount that i hate saying that name because it feels wrong no matter how i say it so yeah i'm with yeah. you and also we can just say jason's father <laughs> oh, <yeah>. jason's father <laughs> um but yeah jason's father essentially when she's rejuvenating him so basically like he's about to die when they find when they eventually get back there he's about to die so they're like oh you know what might as well save him um so jason begs medea like hey can you just save my dad please and um, she's like, well, Hecate wouldn't allow that. So now we've got Hecate's turning her back on her. So not only is Cupid like, no, I'm washing my hands. Even Hecate is like, uh -uh, this is not for me. <laughs> <laughs> and she still does it. She's, she's like, you know what? Hecate won't allow it, but I'm going to do it anyways. So we've got this, this woman now who not only transcends the gods, but also transcends like moral authority and mortal authority because she's eventually as we know she doesn't listen to jason anyways she doesn't care what jason thinks eventually because she ends up killing her kids so we end up with this medea who's neither human nor supernatural but something else and something mm -hmm. more terrifying because of that so it's almost along the lines of seeing Medea as this fully formed character who we started off with as a young girl falling in love and by the end she is this this thing almost not even like characterized as a person mm -hmm. um, because of the way that Ovid kind of displaces her from what we thought we knew. I love that so uh, I've definitely read the Medea sections in in Metamorphoses um, but it was a while ago now. So the only thing that I can remember like really distinctly though, and I remember I like, like was talking about this once and it's like the thing I know specifically is from Ovid and no one else is that moment when she, I, either it's for the potion for Jason's father or, um, or the, when she's like about to kill the other king, um, President of Peleus, um, with like the, his daughters and everything like because she rides around like the whole world on her dragon chariot and it's like the most badass moment of anything ever like she goes everywhere and it's like i'm just riding on my dragons like just getting whatever <laughs> potions i need so i always thought of her as like awesome from that but i'm realizing i don't actually remember any of like the actual characterization of her i just remember her riding around her dragon chariot but that part is also so interesting because when you look at what Ovid says while she's traveling, she's basically, you know, lads torturing Greece through Greece. That's literally what's about to happen. As uh, she like stops off and goes over all of these places. Yeah. And 
if you read it, like he's actually mentioning places where things of either very disastrous forbidden love, ultimate monstrosity, or references to other uses of magic occur. So, oh. um, like, and some of these references are only found in Ovid, either because, yeah. you know, we don't have any, you know, sources back from, from um, the ancient world that tell these stories, or because they're his own inventions. So he's literally, as she's riding around on that chariot, he's literally saying, you know, look at all of these stories and references I can make up of utter monstrosity and think of Medea, because Medea is worse and she's my creation here. Um, so it's kind of like comparing and uniting all of those parts of the Mediterranean through her otherness and marginalization. And we get this view of Medea, who is not only, um, you know, at that point, at the height of her monstrosity, literally, because she's like in the sky, <laughs> but also, <laughs> <laughs> but also because she's literally like, this is the point where she's murdered multiple people. She's, she's got so much blood on her hands. They're just red now. Um, <laughs> so we've got this view of Medea and then we've also got these like little anecdotes here and there which which are like stories of oh you know um oh you know do you not remember that story of like this person killing another person yeah okay let's move on to the next one and there's like 30 different references to different people and places um in that little oh, section um I have to reread this again I'm, I'm like oh my god how do I not remember it's this so fun. I can't wait I love it. <laughs> it's so so fun and um, one of my favorite references um, that he makes throughout the entirety of Medea's story, because there are a lot, <laughs> are the ones to Circe, because it kind of links um, book seven and book 14, which, funnily enough, are seven books apart exactly. So you've got mm. in two different halves of the Met, you've got one witch for each half, and that's almost like it's too much. We can't put any more witches in this in this book, because that's just too much monstrosity. So you've got these two witches equal distance apart, both mm. very similar to each other, both the descendants of Helios, both um, able to wield magic, described as ethnically other, described as, you know, kind of close to the gods, but still very, very distant. And you've, you've got them on both halves of these stories, and one very firmly set in Greece, and the other actually quite close to Rome. So mm. the location of Circe in in Ovid's Met is actually in Sicily. So oh, okay. that itself is trippy. <laughs> yeah, like they're making her Greek by making it like Magna Graeca, but then also like e explicitly not. Yes. So it's kind of like this this closeness to Rome, but also mm -hmm. it's it's like okay, it's a farther and us distance that you know we can we can breathe a little bit, but it's still terrifying because it's mm -hmm. like she's no longer in this mythical island that we don't know about. She's in Sicily. <laughs> she can get to us, <laughs> and that's the terrifying <laughs> right. thing. It's it's so <laughs> interesting how he does that because like obviously he's guiding us closer and closer towards the end of the book to you know actual history and julius mm -hmm. caesar and augustus but in order to do that he has to get closer to rome he has to get closer to where the reader is and and real life and bring yeah. such a mythical character who's so terrifying so close to rome really makes those tensions between closeness and far farness and marginalization and colonialization really pop yeah so so Oh my god, I want to hear about so many different things in, in what you've just said. I have lots of questions already. But specifically, let's start with, so how does Ovid characterize Cersei? Because I really, I don't think that I read those bits, like, because I've read so much of the Odyssey that I never get around to that. I, I also, every once in a while, realize that I've literally never read the end of Metamorphoses when he goes into Rome. Like, when he starts talking about actual Rome, I'm like, oh, right, I've, I have no idea what any of that says. <laughs> So I'm fascinated by what he does with Cersei because, yeah, I, I mean, quick ramble, but like Ovid is so interesting in Metamorphoses specifically because he is so explicitly telling Greek stories through a Roman mm. 
lens that like that alone makes that work so unique. And and like you're saying too, in like we often don't have an earlier source and that doesn't mean that he's not working off an earlier source, but if he is, we don't know it. And that in itself is so interesting. Like what did Ovid invent and what is he basing things on that we don't know about? And anyway, that's all to say, please tell me all about Ovid Cersei. <laughs> Oh, she's absolutely glorious. I love Ovid Cersei. I think it's, okay, this is going to be a very controversial opinion, but I think <laughs> she's my favourite iteration of Cersei. Ooh. Um, just because the stories we get are so explicitly monstrous that it, you have to actually read that and then go back to the Odyssey and read it and be like, hold on a second. What parts did he pick up and what parts did he make himself? Um, yeah. So we start off book 14 with Cersei. So this is the last book before we hit Rome, which has its own significance in itself. Mm -hmm. So we start off with Cersei and um, the previous book has uh, this, this man named Glaucus, who essentially then at the end of book 13 says, you know what, I need help because I'm in love with this girl and I can't, you know, she's not in love with me. She's rejected me. So I'm going to use Cersei's help. So he's running to go find Cersei. And then we find Cersei. And boy, does he wish he didn't. Because um, <laughs> essentially, the girl that he is in love with is Scylla. I'm getting flashes to Madeline Miller. I'm just like, oh, I'm like, oh, right. This is where Madeline Miller got all of that. And I'm remembering yes. that so specifically now. Yes. So this is the Scylla who we know as the sea monster who then, you know, is well, you know, Homer Homer warns that Odysseus should not go near. Mm -hmm. So that's the Scylla we're talking about. And as we know from the Odyssey, it's never really explained how Scylla got there. It's just mm -hmm. more of like, ah, eh, this is her. Um, <laughs> but, and also we get the origins of Charybdis now. Ooh. So, I, I know. love Charybdis <laughs> so much. Me too. I love how it's just kind of like this giant whirlpool. Like, oh, where did it come from? Yeah. No, no, no one knows. No, no <laughs> sentient, but like also just a whirlpool. Oh, it's badass. It's so good. Um, so essentially he goes goes to Cersei and Cersei's like, you know what? You know what would be even better revenge instead of like me making you like fall in love with her or making her fall in love with you? Um, I could just, you know, fall in love with you myself and you could be like my husband and it'd be great. So can we just do that? And she, he's like, uh-uh, I don't want this. <laughs> he's like, I did not consent. <laughs> I don't want this. Um, and she's like, hold on a second. Did you just say no? <laughs> and she's furious and she's really pissed off. And she's like, mm, I'm not happy about this. Um, so I'm going to do something instead. So she goes to the pools where sort of like, you know, usually chills and relaxes and she curses the pools with herbs and then Scylla turns into the sea monster and the description is actually her her groin so her genitals turn into like barking dogs <laughs> so she's basically turned her vagina into barking dogs and so that has its own connotations because obviously that means that Glaucus can now no longer have sex with Scylla so that's its own thing and then after all each other you know after she does all of that then Glaucus goes to her and he's like no 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 this is too much you've done something so <laughs> monstrous that I can't even stand to be here <laughs> and so he literally like hightails it and he's like <laughs> I'm out peace out <laughs> and um then we kind of continue on the story so that's the origin of, of you know Scylla and Charybdis because then those whirlpools that she she was in turns out to be grib this eventually of course so this story this entire story i should mention is being told by macareus and macareus is one of um actually one of odysseus's crew who huh. then ends up like giving directions to aeneas as he's going to rome so that's how we get this entire story so then he tells, you know, he recounts the rest of it and how, you know, um, Odysseus and the crew end up in all their travels. And we get this like mini odyssey that's like, you know, one short story long. So he comprises the entirety of like books, like I think it's like books seven to 11 
in like <laughs> about a, a couple of hundred lines, which itself is its own feat. Um, and we get this like abridged version of the Odyssey that's like, hold on a second, is this actually the Odyssey or this is the bootleg Odyssey? <laughs> <laughs> And then we get to where he meets Circe, so where Odysseus meets Circe, and Odysseus, his oh, well, his men, obviously, as he gets sends them in, she turns them into pigs, and the description there is absolutely it's like chef's kiss. It's perfect because what it describes is that she's taking away their voices, and so Macareus um, is like he was um, tur- in the storyline. He's turned into a pig. So that describes his own voicelessness. And it's one of the only descriptions in the Odyssey where we get not only the story of like human to animal metamorphosis, but animal to human. And that's mm. why the story is often quite picked up by, you know, um, other classical commenters, because it's one of the only iterations we get of, okay, this person was an animal, but now they're coming back to human. And the way that Ovid yeah. describes it is just kind of like, oh, I, I wanted to speak to say like, oh, I'm so glad that I'm human again. And I couldn't because I was just so filled with grief from the entirety of the experience. And it's like you get this kind of PTSD kind of like experience through Macarius's eyes. Yeah. And I think like um, my my favorite part of that is when she. Um, so we always assume from the Odyssey that like, you know, she just spent a whole year like having sex with him um, and just having like having a jolly old time. But the way that <laughs> she, but the way she describes it, well, the way Ovid describes it is as um, a marriage. So she takes him in to the Thalamos. So like literally the marriage bed. Um, mm. So it's just kind of like pseudo wedding. And it's the way she kind of twists law here and twists the idea of marriage. And um, this kind of like um, harkens back to what I was saying at first with the the marriage laws, because these witches, if you see, if you go back to the Medea really quickly, they constantly are seeking marriage. It's not just, you know, I'm just going to have a little fling, I'm going to have live my life, enjoy myself, you know, hot girl summer. (laughs) It's not that. (laughs) It's literally, I want to marry you, you should marry me. And with the Glauca's story again what she says is I want marriage with you with Odysseus again she wants marriage and with the next story that follows she again seeks marriage it's never just okay you know just gonna have a little bit of fun it's a commitment here that's being made and being searched for and every single time these women who seek marriage are rejected because of their monstrosity hmm So the final story of Circe in book 14 is uh, with Picus, and it's the o- origin of the story of um, how we get the woodpecker. Oh. Um, <laughs> so Picus is in love with this girl called Canons, and, you know, everything's going perfectly fine until he accidentally runs into Circe's grove. And Circe sees him and falls in love with him instantly. And she's like, okay, so you're going to marry me, right? Third time lucky. (laughs) And he's like, nope, I'm in love with Canons. And she's like, you know, pissed as per usual. (laughs) And was like, you know what? If you're not going to marry me, then I'm going to like turn you into a woodpecker. And then his men follow after him and are like, "Um, so where's our king? (laughs) And this, I spent like a good two hours just looking at this line but they say that she recited curses and spoke magic words, worshipping unknown gods with unknown incantations, right? So at first I was like, oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. That's fine, it's fine. And then I looked up what word he used for unknown and Mm. you could believe my excitement when he used the word ignoto. So that word is usually like, when you look at commentaries, they say, oh, just translate it as unknown or unfamiliar. 
but the etymology of that word means foreign. So oh. she's speaking to foreign gods here. She's speaking, you know, with a foreign language, a foreign, um, uh, well, obviously likes to use the word karmina when he speaks of witches as they're, they're conducting their spells, they're singing it. Mm. So she's literally singing a foreign song, speaking these to, to these foreign gods and her magic words. And that's what brings in ethnicity here for me. It's the fact that not only is she, you know, quite close to Rome, but not, she's not really Sicilian. She's something else because she mm -hmm. comes from the gods, because she's a descendant of the gods. But she's also speaking a language that isn't, you know, that isn't Roman. It's not Latin. It's not Greek. It's completely foreign. And that's what lets her transform um, Picus. It's what lets her yeah. do all of this um so that's you know it's a, it's a fun line <laughs> yeah so we've got these two like quote-unquote barbarian witches like spread throughout and causing all this trouble oh i love that it's so great i i'm not gonna lie i've literally i've spent months writing about this and i there's just more every time i sit down yeah. i'm like oh you know what i think i thought of everything that i could do and i just keep finding more um yeah. which is fun we love it. <laughs> yeah. Can I tell um, you something I just thought of with all of this? Yeah. Um, so one thing that's never really occurred to me, and this is why I love conversations, because it just makes you think about things in a different way. Like I just, it's great. Um, so I've never really thought about why Aetes and Medea are, are like from Colchis. And then I'm thinking of now, like in association with Circe as well. Like it's always felt weird to me that these children of Helios, these children of like a major Titan god, are barbarians, are not Greeks. Um, and now it seems like I'm not, I'm sure this is obvious to some, or maybe I'm, you know, intentionally discrediting myself, but like, it's where the sun is from. <laughs> like, they're coming from the east. And so they're seeing the sun rise in the east. And, and like, therefore, we get these Eastern gods. And I've just never thought about it this way. Now I'm like, I feel like this was obvious, but maybe it's not. I'm going to take it as not. But I'm now I'm just, it's like running through my brain of like, we've got these Eastern gods, these quote unquote barbarian gods, but really it's just because the sun is literally in the East. That's now I'm obsessed with it. insane. That's so smart. <laughs> it's so fun, right? Like, that's so how did I not think about that <laughs> I just I it's and now I'm like oh my god like it's so interesting like of course they're from Colchis it's literally the east the sun comes up obviously they're over there that means they can't be Greek because the sun is in, in Greece that's so smart <laughs> like genuinely I I had never thought of that that I'm so glad beautiful. I'm so glad because I think of it and I'm like is this the thing that everybody already realizes so I'm very glad that it's not I never thought of that. I just was like, oh, you know, they're connected. And it's like, I, I never well, thought of that. Yeah, because I, I think it all comes down to like the thing that runs through my whole podcast, which is that like we are modern people who live in this modern world with a modern understanding of a modern understanding of storytelling and narrative structure. And so we often like attribute these types of things to like well that was just like a story decision like it was just like a narratological decision to to like make Aetes the king of Colchis because like okay he's from over there or what have you like whoever was first writing that story we think we just they wanted to do that and it's like no that they never wrote stories like we write stories there's always a reason for something it's never just like a random choice to put somebody somewhere and it's like in hindsight, like obvi obviously it's not a random choice to put these explicitly like important Greek deities in not Greece. Like obviously there's a reason for it. Anyway, yeah, it's kind of like very excited saying, by this. Kind of tension of distance. Um yeah. where it's like, oh, you know, they're very close to us, like we're literally reading these texts, they're like right in front of us, but they're also far away, which makes it safe um yeah. so it's kind of like messing with that little bit of tension and pulling and tugging here yeah and then, when then we get to like look at why like what it means that they're eastern so then it's like an examination of like what you're talking about Circe being like not 
Greek, even though she's Greek, you know, and, and Medea being not Greek and like, okay, well, if they're explicitly these Eastern deities just by nature of the sun rising in the East, then then how do we navigate that? Well, Circe gets to speak this foreign language and, and Medea gets these barbarian tendencies and, oh, it's so interesting. It's very fun. I'm not going to lie. I do really, really enjoy just like spending my hours. I'm like, oh, well, I could have written a whole paragraph or I can figure out why this one reference from Ovid is relevant. Like there's one particular reference uh, when Medea is like going across um, the Mediterranean of the Telkinets. And I was like, hold on a second, who are they? I was like, I've never heard of them before yeah. in my life. Um, so I was like, you know what? I'm going to figure out why he put those in and who the hell are the Telkinets? So I was like, you know what? First things first, <laughs> get the commentary out. It's got the commentary out and they're like, oh, it's a reference to an ancient race of magic users. And I was like, hmm. what? I was like, okay, that sounds cool. Then I go a foreign. little bit deeper. <laughs> then I go a little bit deeper and I, I'm like, okay, where did he get that name from? Like, I'm going to just type it into Google and then I see Callimachus and I'm like, Callimachus, you mean the same Callimachus that inspired a whole bunch of Ovid and his short poetry? So I was like, hmm, let's read some Callimachus. Then Callimachus then tells me that the Telkinids were like an ancient evil race of magic users who basically did something to the gods we don't know what they did something to the gods and they were essentially destroyed like wiped off the face of the planet because Ooh. they offended the gods <laughs> um which if you think about it a lot of connotations and relations to medea then because like yes. if we've got this ancient race of magic users literally wiped off of the face of the earth because they disrespected the gods and medea's done so twice in her story by, with Cupid and Hecate, then I don't know. I see links. Yeah. I see links. <laughs> well, well, not to mention, like though it's not necessarily explicit in in the versions of Medea we have, but like her, her killing, I guess just mostly her killing her children. So like that Euripidean idea is like inherently the worst thing you can do, right? Like if if mm -hmm. anything is going to bring the Furies down on you it's killing a family member. So we don't have versions where she gets, you know, chased by the Furies, but like you can presume that it happened. So you even got like it in, in, you've got that, those explicitly angry in the gods, er, uh, Cupid and, and Hecate. And then, and then like it, not so explicit, but certainly the number one thing the gods are going to punish you for of like killing your family members. Exactly. And like, yeah. um, just to, continue on my my rabbit hole i then mm. started thinking i got like a little footnote and the footnote was to strabo and i was like what Ooh. what does strabo have to do with this so i literally went on a rabbit hole through like from latin to greek back to latin and then i went to strabo and i was like hold on a second wh why am I being redirected to strabo and turns out not only did this race you know disrespect the gods but they were also rivals to um they were also rivals to Callimachus. And I was like, how can they be magic users and rivals? Well, the first poem in um in Callimachus Calimachus's, I think it's his ETR, is basically called Against the Telkinets, where he literally says, you know, I hate these people because they hate my short poetry. And apparently they've like mm. complained for years about how short his poetry is. And he's like, well, my poetry needs to be short because I'm not going to write volumes and volumes. And I was like, okay, cool, cool, cool. But then I'm what like- What a weird complaint. I love that. <laughs> exactly. <It's so laughs> I was short. like, cool, cool, cool. Mm. He's like, they're like, I don't like it. I want epics. And I'm like, me too. But like, let the man write his poetry. Um, <laughs> and I was like, what does this have to do with Medea? And I just had, I sat down with it for days and I was like, what does this have to do with Medea? Why has he mentioned them? And then I remembered who also writes short poetry? Ovid. Okay. So who also uses magic? Medea. Who, so he's basically saying that just like the Telkines are rivals to Callimachus, I've got my own rival and my rival is not only any old race of magic users, it's Medea her herself. Oh and not only... I know. And not only is it Medea herself, 
it is Medea who is currently riding all across Greece, has killed like four people by this point. Um, and she's a better rival than you. And also she can sing her own songs. So it's not even like she is just, um, you know, this figure who just wields magic. She also uses Carmina in the same way mm. that Ovid does. But her, her Carmina is one that causes monstrosity while his Carmina is one where, you know, he can change forms like he does, he says at the beginning of the Metamorphosis. So he's rivaling Callimachus here by modeling a kind of literary rival throughout his yeah. story. And that literary rival are the witches that he put in the Met. And it's like, it's this whole full circle moment. And it's like, I spent three days on this and I didn't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. There's so many in that little passage of her, like riding across the Aegean. Like, there's mm -hmm. so many little stories that's like, oh, this is a random offhand story that relates to someone killing their family member. And I'm like, mm. ah, wonder why he put mm. that there. Mm. Um, so it's kind of like you, you get these little rabbit holes when you see Ovid, and he's, he mentions so many things offhand. And I first I was just like, oh, he's just doing this to show off. So like saying like, you know, I've got like a whole storybook in my head, like <laughs> gang gang. <laughs> so at first it's like, okay, that's fine. And then I'm like, hold on a second. He wouldn't just put that there for nothing. Like he said, like, there's no reason why he would put that there and fill up the, you know, the meter of like his lines for nothing. So once you dig deep into those references, you get anecdotes that relate to the main story and it's just it's a whole full circle oh. moment it's great i just want to read so much more of the metamorphoses i uh, i'm like oh my god i i don't know nearly enough now i i'm obsessed with it especially what i love about ovid is you know we've mm -hmm. been talking today about two greek like mainly about two greek witches here inherited by like you know from greece he is essentially right rewriting these stories um as his own kind of fan fiction of like mm -hmm. what he wants to happen and how he wants to perceive these witches um, who kind of lie on the extremes of femininity and of ethnicity as well. So what I'm kind of mainly focused on is how we can view them as intersectional beings who are being discriminated in this text, who are being portrayed in a very specific way that kind of makes us not want to like them and why that might be. Yeah. Well, a Metamorphoses is so great for, like you're saying, fan fiction, because it really, it's like, he's doing his own whole thing. Like these, it, it, it is a Roman source. He's coming at it as a Roman. But at the same time, like 90% of the stories in there are explicitly Greek. So he, but he doesn't have the same connection and he doesn't have the same like skin in the game, I guess, as, as like the Greek authors writing these or or not even writing but like you know putting them to paper after after so many years or d generations of oral storytelling like those people were coming at them as like this is our history and culture this is our like whole world whereas then Ovid comes in and he's kind of like I can do whatever I want with this because it isn't my history it isn't my culture like I can look at it in however in whatever way I want and that's kind of why I love him his stories are so like visceral and they're just they're just so interesting his versions not to mention i think that he actually like is interested in in examining trauma particularly like sexual trauma w amongst yeah. the gods and things in a way that no other author tends to really like be into but oh i just I'm so thrilled to be having this be like revolving entirely around the metamorphoses. It's something that like I haven't gone back to that text in too long now, and I'm realizing that. And I'm like, okay, like how See, how can I dive I, back in? Because yeah. I first read it in translation. I first read everything in translation. Um, I mean, I don't I, I don't know Latin or Greek, so no judgment there. <laughs> it's taken me a hot moment, and I'm still on the journey. But I will get there eventually. Eventually, I will be so fluent in Latin and Greek that I will just be able to just interchangeably use it in everyday conversation. Oh, I but love it's that. It's taking a moment because, like you know, not it's everyone not grows up knowing Latin and Greek and studies it yeah. in school. Like that's not a thing, and we need no. to break out of the norms of of expecting that of people as well. Um, so 
what I was going to say was that <laughs> um, I first read it on translation. And so in translation, a lot of this, these details are omitted. They're not really like mm. brought in because they're either, it doesn't fit the, the natural flow of the storyline. Like these references don't really help the natural flow and they're not as important to what we're trying to get to, which is the main overarching storyline. Mm -hmm. So they're usually omitted, or if they're mentioned, then they're like offhand lines that don't really make much sense. Um, so when you go back to the Latin and you look at it and you're like, this is a completely different text. <laughs> this is mm -hmm. not what I read. <laughs> um, like, for example, like a really good example of that actually is when in mm -hmm. Medea's soliloquy, when she essentially starts talking about why she should go for Jason, because she's kind of tossing and turning between the two options she kind of spends a hot moment just going well you know what why would i want to stay in colchis anyways why would i want to stay in this barbarian land where there's no art and there's no culture and like where um you know i would be so much better off in greece anyways and it's like it comes from this very colonialist standpoint if you look back at it mm. from like saying like you know barbarian culture doesn't have anything to give us except people like Medea you know otherwise we've got you know arts and culture of Greece and why would I not want to go there and I'm going to be a hero once I've saved Jason and everyone will love me and I wouldn't have ever known she said that unless I looked at the original because it doesn't mm specifically say that in a lot of translations of that it doesn't accurately kind of get that across of like hey this is what he's actually saying i truly believe mm. that we should get like literal translations out some of every single text even if it doesn't make sense because i know it's so hard right like you so yeah that's why I, yeah. I i refer to like two or three different translations with everything or i try to with everything i i cover because yeah like you're just gonna get such completely different details or like just different meaning like some just conveys it so much better so i kind of wanted to circle back around to like my my project as a whole and mm -hmm. some of the things that generally kind of like why you know kind of why i got here to this point because i never actually like properly had like a module on witches in the ancient world or anything like that so my my journey towards doing witches and intersectionality in the ancient world is a bit of a roundabout one um so because okay this is a podcast and no one can actually see me <laughs> i am a, a black woman i'm also queer um so i have like a very unique experience of, um in when looking at the ancient world especially because i was when i first study classics was told that i would never find anyone like me in the ancient world which just isn't true what i know <laughs> i know that's i was also told there was no black people in the ancient world and that's just jesus not h true. christ no, exactly. my god like <laughs> and yeah. so no black people you... egypt was super white i don't know what you're talking about exactly so um <laughs> that so coming into like studying classics um was truly an experience of not seeing myself and wanting to and mm -hmm. kind of saying you know what this can't be right i'm gonna find it and i'm gonna seek out something that resembles how i feel about my own experiences because you know why not and um then in the third year of my undergrad I like we did this like a uh, course on contemporary approaches and it was one of the best things because I could, could see the modules like coming up like the um the like what we're going to study and mm. intersectional theory I think was like week three and I was like hold on a second what's that because <laughs> like the first couple of weeks were on the sublime so I was actually like okay you know what I, <laughs> I I can get with that I know what that is but what the hell is intersectional theory and why have i not heard of it before um and we spent like a whole lesson just like d going over like um audrey lord kimberly crenshaw mm. um and kind of like why people who have multiple different um marginalizing factors or experiences are then kind of marginalized in social contexts um and from that i was like we can use that in classics <laughs> i was like what <laughs> And then I was like, hold on a second, I'm gonna do something with this. <laughs> um, 
And then my master's came around because I couldn't use it by that point for my undergrad dissertation. So I was like really sad about it um, because by that point I had already had a full formed um, project, which ended up being on feminism in general. But it was like, I uh, can't really make a detour right now. So then master's came around and I was like, I'm going to use that theory because oh, that sounds great. Um, and I dug my heels into that and I absolutely loved it. And I did it on um, Plautus's Proenulus, which is a mm. very understudied text. <laughs> um, so if anyone listening to this wants to do something on Plautus and his Proenulus, I'm very happy if you do. <laughs> um, but essentially it's about, um, it's a Carthaginian text um, in which oh, like shit. Plautus talks about um, how these women are from Carthage who got kidnapped and then their dad comes to save them and they end up in Greece somehow and then they get saved and then they're like oh hold on a second I'm not a female slave anyways I was actually a freeborn woman and so you get like loads of different um experiences in that and identities in it in which you've got like a female slave who's from North Africa who is very characteristically um like probably of a dark skin tone as well who's being talked about on the Roman stage <laughs> during the Punic Wars. And yeah. it's an amazing text of like layers of different ethnicities and identities. And it's very fun. <laughs> and honestly, one of my favorite texts um, because reading it is one very funny because it's comedic text, um, but also really entertaining how you see it you know um expressions of gender and sexuality and ethnicity portrayed because we are talking about prostitutes here literally like you know um procuring themselves out on the stage um in front of the roman audience after the second punic war um huh. so very beautiful layers there um yeah. and then i did that in my projects on that loved it and i was like hold on a second I could write more about intersectional experiences in the ancient world. And I was like, but what would I do it on? And I was like, hold on a second. Let me think back to my undergrad dissertation, which was literally on feminist views of, of how we can perceive classics. And I did like um, a whole section on witches in it and, and how we can see witches as like the utmost ex um, kind of versions of monstrosity and like women mm -hmm. becoming like a necessary evil for Rome. So then I went back to that and I was like, I can do something with that. That looks good. Oh, yeah. And so I started my uh, my PhD thinking I was going to do a project very generally on all intersectional experiences in imperial Latin literature. And then like, obviously, when you go through a PhD, you narrow and you narrow until you get to something mm -hmm. that you're like, I can write like 100,000 words on this. And um, I was like, hold on a second. I just want to talk about witches because there's something here. And it's incredibly interesting, but I don't see a lot of people talking about it in the way that I'm talking about it. And mm -hmm. I think I can, I think I could write a hundred thousand words on it and kind of like getting to this point where I see these really specific experiences of where ethnicity and gender and um, often sexuality kind of come to play and kind of, and without using the word, but intersect again <laughs> um, mm -hmm. over the different kind of barriers of being marginalized but also being powerful in their marginalization and their power mm -hmm. being a driving force for us to see their marginalization um it really interested me but also it felt like i was kind of drawing a kind of personal connection to an experience that i could resonate with so um yeah i i love that that's so i mean it's just powerful but like it it reminds me so much of, of how much I've learned from doing this show because, you, you know, even just saying like in your undergrad learning, like, or the suggestion that there's no one, you know, who looks like you or has a similar experience, like in the ancient world is like so wild, but also so widespread. Like we have this whole idea of this like whiteness that's been put upon the ancient world in I mean for obvious like western supremacy reasons but then as soon as you like start looking at it with any kind of critical eye it's like I mean it, it just ends up being so obviously ridiculous um yeah. I mean it, it uh, the, the interactions that what I'm most interested in lately is like the the interactions across the whole Mediterranean in the east in North Africa like the fact that 
in these stories, we have like not only Egypt, but Libya and Ethiopia, like all these regions of North Africa that would have obviously had people with a darker skin tone and they're all interacting across the whole Mediterranean world. And it's like, it seems to me it's such an like it's such an obvious thing that obviously people had all you know were were of all these different varying skin tones but then at the same time looking at like the ways in which Greece and certainly Rome um were also like super bigoted in their own way and it was like not necessarily about skin tone but it was like all about all these other things where it's like everyone has been problematic forever but just like the level the ways in which these things are an issue has varied so much like that alone is is so fascinating and i think it's really important to to talk about generally and and like and bring up in this way but but the witches specifically being being othered in that way like i have i have seen the connection in roman witches of the way that they the roman witches to me feel very anti woman but but looking at ovids more specifically because i don't think i've I don't think the, the the conversations I've had or the thoughts that I've had on this have have touched on Ovid's because Ovid's feel so Greek that it's almost like they don't count. But then, but exactly everything you're saying, it's like no, they count in like their own way. Like they're they're Greek witches, but he still romanizes them in that very specific way. Yeah, and I think um, like even just kind of understanding what well, my hope is that through understanding the ways in which we see these imperial witches we can start to unveil and uncover some of the ways that real roman witches were perceived in rome so how does a person who you know uses medicine or magic navigate their ethnicity and their gender and their sexuality and age through the ancient world and of course like a ability runs into it as well how does um someone who perhaps is uh you know for example someone from north africa who is a slave but is also someone who uses magic um like how are they perceived how are they differentiated and treated in rome how can we see that is it does it correlate to the literature does the literature tell us about that and that's the most for me at least that's the most interesting thing the fact that behind every single one of these these very fictional very literary very mythical characters we see in text there most likely is a real person that existed who shares some of those qualities and we can see and evaluate how if we can't see how evaluate how they were treated like, you know literally because we don't have the sources for that we can see how people who share those characteristics are treated in text mm-hmm mm-hmm Oh yeah, I love the idea of the real people behind it, especially in Rome, because like again, I don't have the greatest knowledge, but like I know the Carthage of it all, and so it, like it, just that alone, they have such an interesting relationship with Carthage. But I'm sure that also meant that there were a lot, a lot of enslaved people from Carthage, and yeah. so you have that like inherently North African like enslaved population, and what that would mean because they also probably had like a very specific or different at least relationship to magic or or witchcraft or or like um basically like early forms of medicine but would if if they were doing it in a way that it's like inherently so different from rome then rome is immediately going to see it as witchcraft particularly if a woman is doing it and if a foreign woman is doing it it's like it's inherently witchcraft in a way that is sort of in itself fascinating yeah, and I think it just draws back to the overarching and like huge debate of what is magic, what is religion, how do we characterize that? Um, does it have anything to do with where or what that magic is? Are we talking mm. about someone's magic is that or someone else's religion that is just too different from what we perceive as normal? Um, so that's also something that I'm going to be spending a good 10,000 words talking about <laughs> yeah well when you have more on like the real people behind it if you do or any of that oh my god come back on certainly for oh, anything sure. but also like that's <laughs> fascinating just thinking about the the real people it reminds me I don't know if you listened to the episode I did with Christy Vogler who um, yes. is looking at witchcraft and medicine yeah that one was so fascinating too because it it's so it touches on that like in a way where it's like if a woman was doing it it was witchcraft and if a man was doing it it's medicine and like that alone is yes. so interesting but adding the like then the the issues of of like 
foreign and and like the intersecting of of like the different regions and things even on top of that would be extra interesting and you know what's really funny is that when you mentioned that it just reminded me that in Ovid's Met with Medea there is a part in it where she tells Jason what herbs to use and what words to say but Mm. he's not a magician only Medea is Medea is the sorcerer but Jason isn't even when he uses the exact same tools that she does um yeah yeah it's like that's really saying something it's really like perpetuating that connection between female magic and male medicine Mm -hmm. yeah especially with Jason it like really is just like salt in the wound too right oh yeah (laughs) hate that guy (laughs) oh I mean god who doesn't who doesn't he's just ridiculous Oh, I, I'm so fascinated with all of this. Like, I, I just hadn't realized how, I mean, I know Medea is always seen as like a quote unquote barbarian, but the idea that Cersei becomes that as well in Ovid and the, then the inherent link that has two witches is brand new information and I'm kind of obsessed with it now. Well, I've got, um, when I eventually finish my PhD, fingers crossed, um, you will be one of the first people I send it to. <laughs> oh please and just come right back on the show and tell me everything else that you've learned since then and we'll have a great time <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it'll be super fun as well because i would have been not only one finish so i can finally like exhale um <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i would have done like other texts as well probably mm-hmm. uh, fingers crossed hopefully um drawn some other connections um because i can almost tell that i'm gonna have a lot of fun um comparing uh seneca's medea and of oh, yeah. because yeah seneca does something very different with medea he takes he doesn't take the euripidean version at all um he essentially takes ovids and he's like i can make it more bloody <laughs> and oh. it is the most gruesome thing <laughs> because he, he's literally like he talks about childbirth and and the womb and how that she's like giving up her children and it's kind of like this weird sensation of the foreigner being at the center of the household because she's a woman who's literally at the head of the household. She's the, you know, the the mater in the in the family in family, but she's also the one who's going to kill her children. And it's just this beautiful little juxtaposition that goes throughout his his um, entire play. So definitely something you should read if you haven't. I know. I was just gonna say. I know. I I know. I should read Seneca's Medea, and it's like I always. It's it's on my list, but I always forget it's there until somebody mentions it, and then I'm like, shit. I really, really want to read that, but I just I need to read more Rome, more Roman literature generally. Yeah, hopefully we can keep you on the Roman side for a little bit. <laughs> oh, I know. We'll see. I just keep getting drawn right back to the Greek. You know. Well, there's so much good things in Greece, though. There are so many good things in Greece. Exactly. I'm fucking obsessed now with Ovid's metamorphoses and specifically Medea and Circe. And, like, now I'm thinking, I'm trying to think of, like, how how I can accompany this episode, like, with, like, a deeper retelling of those parts of metamorphoses. Specifically those two witches in Ovid, like people often go straight to like the Her- Herodes or go straight to the mm-hmm. uh, cures for love when they're trying to find like Ovidian versions of Medea and Circe. But in the Met itself, it's just so great. And I I know I've gushed about it for like almost an hour and a half now, but it, there's so much and I feel like I barely hit like the top tip of the iceberg. There's so much. Uh-huh. It's just, yeah, I, I had no idea. And that actually reminds me, um, I, just hearing you talk about Medea in Metamorphoses is so interesting when you compare it to Heroides. It's been a while since I read that Heroides, but like it always felt very sympathetic to her, to me. Like it's very anti Jason and pro Medea. And I, is she very witchy in that? I feel like she's not. She's very human in the Heroides. Yeah, I think almost because she, of it just I'm kind wrong. of writing from her perspective, that might right. slightly change things because it's like, of course, you're going to be sympathetic towards yourself. Um, yeah. But then the difference is like in the Met is that he's telling the story, which is very rare for the Met where like, you know, the, the stories are usually told by someone else. Someone else is mm-hmm. telling this. 
But Ovid himself tells Medea's story. He tells us exactly how monstrous he thinks she is and exactly how horrifying he is. Mm. And I feel like that says it itself in itself all, all we need to know. Yeah, that's so true. Oh, I love that. Oh, it's just all so interesting. Fucking ancient sources. They're so fun. <laughs> this has been so interesting and so much fun. Thank you so much for doing this. I have really enjoyed it. I was like very like, this is the first podcast I've ever done. So podcast virgin here. Um, and and I've had so much fun. Like genuinely, I have had so much fun just being able to just talk and like all the cool things that I found that may not wake its way to my like final piece. And it's just, it's nice. And I don't have anything good to plug. So follow me on Twitter. <laughs> Uh, nerds. Thank you, as always, for listening. If you didn't already guess, we recorded this episode back before I'd started reading Ovid's Metamorphoses to you all on the podcast, because here I am ranting about how I haven't been deep enough into that source lately. I'm not saying this conversation was the inspiration, but it, it, it basically was. I just wish I could have gotten to the bit where Medea and Cersei appear by now in the reading, but those are books 7 and 14, so we've got some time to go. Still, Metamorphoses. I am obsessed. Huge thank you to Antonia for joining me on this episode. It was seriously so much fun. And now I'm going to think about Helios and his children living where the sun rises from in the east just for the rest of time. Even if I might have forgotten that revelation until just now when I edited the episode. Because there's seriously so much information in my brain. There's no room for any more. I am all filled up. <laughs> you can follow Antonia on Twitter. Uh, I realize I didn't get her actual handle in time, but it is in the episode's description. Anyway, this was so fun. I love witches. Going to watch Hocus Pocus 2 now, I think. Let's Talk About Myths Baby is written and produced by me, Liv Albert. Michaela Smith is the Hermes to my Olympians and handles so many podcast-related things, from running the YouTube to creating promotional images and videos to editing and research, and now Patreon things, too! Stephanie Foley works to transcribe the podcast for YouTube captions and accessibility. The podcast is hosted and monetized by Acast. Help me continue bringing you the world of Greek mythology and the ancient Mediterranean by becoming a patron, where you will get bonus episodes and more. Visit patreon.com slash mythsbaby or click the link in this episode's description you are super cool thank you for listening please keep it up i am live and i love this shit <laughs>